Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm sitting in my house, in my uh, at my office in my house in Tel Aviv, Israel. There is a sunny day outside. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. And I'm very happy to have this chance to talk to you today about privacy. Um, you, we hear so much. Uh, so, do you see my screen? Just to make sure everybody sees my screen and see me on uh, webcam. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy to talk to you today about the dark future of privacy or the last days of privacy. And this is very, very important to remember. Privacy is not dead, but it is dying. And the things that are going to happen in the years to come are so amazing and unique in the field of privacy. And I want to talk about several things. I'm not going to present myself. You already know about me. Um, so just, I will just tell you that I have my company, Say Tactic, and we're doing cybersecurity consulting for big companies all over the world. This is it. Um, so the dark future of privacy. And it starts with the fact that recently, in almost every time that someone asked me to speak on TV, it was related to, somehow it was related to privacy. It seems like the topic of privacy re-emerged as a very, very central topic in the audience discussion. Everybody talks about privacy. And in, and, and in one of my last interviews, something happened. Uh, the lady, I was talking about privacy and how big data companies have new ways to collect data, and they asked me about those new ways, and I, and I showed some techniques. And, and at the end of the interview, the lady interviewed me, she asked a question. Now, that was a very simple question, a very easy question. Nevertheless, I was sitting there on live TV, and I didn't know what to say. I was amazed by this question. And, 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 and on television, sitting there not speaking is a very, very embarrassing thing. And on television, sometimes you have 10 seconds to convey a message that otherwise would take you 20 minutes. And this question that the lady that interviewed me asked me, after I told her that those companies have new ways to connect us, she asked me, so what? So what? what? What's the damage? Why should we? Why should we care about the fact that companies have new ways of collecting data? And, and this is amazing because it seems like many, many people talk about the fact that they hate companies that are living in privacy, but it's very hard for them to explain why. And it's very hard to, to, for them to explain why don't they want companies to collect data. And I was thinking about this question for, for, for the following two weeks after this interview. And I developed this short exercise. Let's, let's go through this exercise. And this exercise uh, starts with, with a simple scenario. In Israel, we have the most amazing beach. We have the most amazing sea. If you ever get a chance to go to it, I recommend you to go uh, to the beach and you really enjoy it. So I'll tell you a story. And I will tell it as a man, but you can translate the same story to a woman. Let's say you go with your girlfriend to the beach. Now you're sitting there on the sand, you're having fun, you're waiting, you're wearing your bathing suit. She's happy, you're happy, you're taking pictures, you're drinking, you're eating fruits, everything is great. Uh, and you're doing all the traditional pictures, you're dancing towards the sea, uh, you're holding the bottle, every, everything. And you're taking those 30, 40 pictures and you upload them to Facebook, like everyone else is doing. The next day you get to your workplace, you open the door and you discover that one of your friends actually printed one of the pictures of your girlfriend wearing a bikini and he posted it, he actually stuck this, this picture in his wall in his office. You look at this guy and you tell him, oh, sorry, why do you have a picture of my girlfriend on your wall? And he said, well, you publish it on Facebook. And you say, yeah, well, so you publish it on Facebook because you thought people would enjoy watching it. I really enjoy watching it. So I printed it and put it on my wall. And, and, and you're saying, come on, this is, not, this is not something you can do. 
please don't take pictures out of my face if they put it on the wall it makes no sense this is my girlfriend he says okay okay i'm sorry i didn't mean to make you angry he takes the the, the picture down and he throw it away the next day now you're angry yeah this is a picture of your baby the next day you get to your workplace you open the door and again this guy is smiling but now instead of printing one of your Picture, he actually has a, 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 a shortcut on his desktop that when you double click it, you get to, your, to the same picture, your girlfriend picture wearing the video face. Now you're really getting angry. You're telling him, Come on, we had this discussion yesterday. Are you crazy? Why do you have a link to my girlfriend's, to my girlfriend's uh, picture on Facebook? Now he's really confused. He says, I, I don't understand. You posted this picture on Facebook because you wanted people to watch it. It's there. I didn't do anything. I'm just watching it. You feel you, you, you're, you're you're a bit confused because you feel that it was okay for you to publish those pictures, but it's not okay that people watch them. And it's very hard for you to explain why you're really angry with this guy. And you're telling him, please don't watch any of my girlfriend pictures on Facebook. Don't have any shortcuts. Don't do that. I feel that this is not something you should do. And he says, okay. I didn't mean to be angry. He deletes his shortcut and, and he keeps on doing whatever he's doing. And you go to your chair, everything is well. The next day, you're getting to your office. You're already angry. Why? Because you know that good examples come in threes. You open the door and you see that this guy is watching uh, Facebook. He's like looking on, on, on your Facebook. He's not watching any of your girlfriend pictures, just your pictures on Facebook. You're getting so mad. You're telling him, come on. We had this discussion. I don't want you to go into my life. You feel that this person violates your privacy just by watching your Facebook profile. And it makes no sense. On one hand, it was okay for you to publish those pictures. On the other hand, it makes no sense. You feel that it's not okay to get watch Apparently, privacy is all about context. The same data in different scenarios might be considered okay for privacy violation. When we publish a picture on Facebook, we publish it with a set of rules. Those are those those are invisible rules. Nobody knows about them. Nobody discuss them. We just expect people to behave according to those invisible rules. Those rules might say that it is okay for people to watch some of those pictures as a, as part of the whole picture. But it's not okay for them to take just one picture of both sides. It's okay to watch those pictures while you scroll down on Facebook. And it's not okay to watch those pictures when they type your name on the search bar, go to the specific Facebook pictures, and click and click on the on the uh, on the uh, collection to watch those pictures. It is okay to watch those pictures when you're walking down the street. It's not okay to watch those pictures when you're home alone or whatever. We have some invisible rules with those pictures. Privacy is all about context. It is okay that people watch you walking down the street. It's not okay that people stare at you when you walk down the street. Imagine this, this person is having a video, a video channel. Now every week he's talking to this camera and a million people watch him. 10 million people, 100 million people watch him through this camera. And he's in his house, in his room, he has this camera and the camera catches all the room, 100 million people off the Suddenly, someone starts looking at him from the window. There's just one person out of 100 million people. But because this person watches you in real life, not in the camera, you know it's a privacy violation. What's the damage in privacy violation? Imagine this, you're home alone, you're dancing, you think that nobody watches you, so you do your song that you like. You're giving your the, the best show in your life, and then you turn it around and you see that someone's watching you. Someone who loves you. Your mother, father, brother, sister, girlfriend, boyfriend, the husband, wife, children, someone is watching you. Wow, this is this is really embarrassing. You're you're blushing, you're getting angry, you're shutting the door, and you don't want to see this person for the next hour. And the same day, someone hacked 
into your 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 credit card. Someone stole your credit card and used it to buy something for three hundred dollars. Amazingly enough, almost always people prefer someone stealing money from their credit card and now to experience in the first scenario where someone's watching them and that's it while while they sleep in their home alone. And that's amazing because because when they think they are home alone, there's no damage. Someone's watching you, no, no real tangible damage. But, but in the second scenario, when someone stole three hundred dollars, there is real tangible damage. For people always prefer someone stealing money and not someone watching them doing something embarrassing. The damage in privacy violation is privacy violation. When we feel that our privacy was violated, someone is knowing something about us that we didn't want them to know, or someone saw us doing something, or someone staring at us, and we feel too self-aware of what's going on, this is the damage for privacy. Keeping that in mind, our story begins in June 2013, when we elected the king of digital privacy. I don't know if you remember the king of digital privacy that we elected in June 2013, but it was this guy. This is Edward Snowden. He used to work for the most top secret agency in the United States, which was which is the NSA, the National Security Agency. The things that Edward Snowden revealed to the world is a secret project in Prism. Prism is a project that um, allowed the NSA to collect data from companies like Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and others into their into their servers. The NSA had more access to data than any other agency in the world. And that showed us two things. This is the original presentation. This is a top secret presentation. Nobody should have ever watched this presentation except for several people in the United States government. But now everybody else in the world can watch this presentation. This is this is the NSA's top secret presentation, and this is this teach us two things. Number one, as I, as I said, the NSA has access to a huge amount of private data, and number two is that the NSA is really, really bad with designing presentations. Um, and because of that, because of those revelations, people declared Edward Snowden to be to be um, their hero, and they started criticizing the United States government. And, and and that started the era of digital privacy. Everybody started talking about privacy. To some extent, the GDPR, if you're familiar with that, the regulations of the EU about privacy, is the result of what Edward Snowden did in June. But now, ladies and gentlemen, drum roll please, we are about to elect our new president, our new king of digital privacy. And believe it or not, our new king is this guy. And it's not about politics, and it's not about whether you like him or hate him, agree with him or don't agree with him. What you must agree is that Donald Trump was the person who brought the discussion about fake news to the public. And what I want to argue today is that fake news is a much bigger problem than what you will imagine. And I'm going to do that by telling you three stories. I'm going to convey three points. Point number one starts apparently with a joke. And I have this slide because it forces me to tell a joke, even though I'm really bad with telling jokes. So I'm going to tell this joke and please try to laugh, even though I don't hear you, try to laugh so it will make me feel better. And the joke is, um, how many psychologists do you need to replace to change your life? And the answer is one, but it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to cost a lot of money. And the light bulb should really want to change. I know, I know, it's a bad joke, I told you. But the thing is, I'm telling you this joke for a reason. One of the biggest lies that our parents tell us as kids is that we are very unique, we are very special, and there is no one like you in the world. But the truth is that though humanity is constantly dealing with the differences between us, we are constantly talking about the, 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 the color of our skin, uh, the guts that we pray to, the, the food that we eat, uh, the language that we speak, the, 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 the things that we do. We are constantly dealing with the differences between us. But the truth is that people are almost identical. <coughs> our brain is some kind of computer program 
the same input will cause the same output for every round. A joke, a better joke, not mine, but a better joke would cause everyone in the world We are watching a movie. Everyone, people that consider, uh, the, the, the people that hate one another, that consider the other person as an enemy, people that, that say that we couldn't be more different from one another, watch the same movie. We're all in, we're all laughing at the same point, making the same broke assumptions, are surprised by the same things. And the most amazing thing about this movie is that the person who wrote the script for this movie was sitting home alone. He said, he, he wrote the script and he said, you know what, if it makes me laugh, it will probably make everyone else in the world laugh. We are so similar to one another that this person doesn't have to leave his house to know how his script will affect us. We're getting into a new website. This website requires us to select a new password. We select a password and then we claim that we discover that our password is one of the most common passwords in the world. It's not like people met somewhere, humanity met somewhere and we all decided we're going to choose the same password. No. People from different places around the world are choosing different passwords and then we discover that our passwords are very, very common. So this is an amazing slide to me. And in, in my experience, it works 100% of the time. And it shows you that we are all thinking exactly at the same way. We're going to do a magic trick. If you're familiar with this magic trick, try not to run into the people that think that's you if you're sitting between next to other people. I'm not trying to influence you in any way. You have your free will. Please feel free to choose any card. You can choose any card. Just make sure you memorize this card. You're remembering exactly the scar. You choose a card now. If you have a card in your mind, I will do the magic trick, and your card is attached to that. Now, I hope that you're amazed by this amazing magic trick. But the thing is that some of you have already got the point. None of those cards appear in the next slide. So it doesn't matter which card you would choose, it will vanish. We have magicians because people are very similar to one another. We have writers, we have books, we have jokes, we have psychologists, we have everything because people are very similar to one another. But it goes much more deeper than just laughing at the same joke. Current and updated psychological researches show us that people have predictable cognitive biases and heuristics. That means that we in some, in some places, we behave exactly at the same way. And there are amazing experiments that show you that. Do you know who this guy is? This is Daniel Kahneman. He's a Nobel Prize winner. He wrote uh, a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. This is a clear book that describes how, how common, how similar are the way, is the way let me give you just, just a few examples. When you get into a restaurant, the menu in this restaurant is designed in the way that is supposed to make you, uh, to, 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 to lead you to make a certain decision. For example, it is known that people almost never buy the most expensive meal in the menu. The goal of this meal is only to make you feel that other meals are not expensive. People will almost always buy the second, third, and fourth most expensive thing in the menu. So if you go to a restaurant and they have burger for $30, but they have uh, fish for $140, and they have um, and they have uh, um, um, pasta for $75, $30 for a burger feels amazingly well. But if you go to a napkin restaurant and they have exactly the same burger, but they have pizza for $8. They have salad for seven dollars, and you can get pasta for twelve dollars. Thirty dollars for a burger sounds amazingly high, but this is amazing because our brain uses irrelevant information to make a decision. The prices of other meals in the menu are irrelevant to the question whether thirty dollars is a good price for a burger. So this is the same thing, and this happens every time, everywhere. If you want to know, if you go into a shop and you 
want to know what they're trying to sell you, you should look at, at, at what do they put this object here. So if there is a, a washing machine and there is another washing machine next to it, and the one that so it is twice as the, the price is twice as high, you know that they are trying to sell you the other um, uh, washing machine. Uh, so this is a great picture that shows that if you see under the button number two, there is a missing button, and the purpose of this button was to close the door, but this actually was a fake button, it just fell off. And apparently it was good enough, because few people feel that as long as they press this button, the doors are closing with that. Okay, so keep that in mind, we have similar content devices. Story number two deals with privacy mining, a collection of more and more and more of our privacy. And that's going to be a big deal in the years to come, because of a small change that the technology is going to go through. And I want to talk about when people think about collecting data, they think about sensors. They think about, let's use cameras, microphones, and others. But let's take an example of a cable box. This cable box has no sensors. It doesn't have a camera inside. It doesn't have a microphone inside, no GPS, no uh, movement sensor, nothing. We need an only control to the very Now think about how much information this stupid device my about. So he knows if we are working or not. He knows um, whether we are sick today or not. He knows whether we entered a relationship just just by seeing what kind of things that we watch on TV. He knows if we have kids at what age. He knows if we lost our job. He knows so many things about us, and it doesn't even have one sense. Just by seeing when. We are watching things, what we are watching, it might know if we are gay or not, might know if we like certain things or other things, and this device has no solid senses. And in the years to come, we are about to connect billions and billions and billions and billions of new devices to the internet, and this will change the call of the internet of things. The internet of things is a good thing, because we are making things smart. Shoes become smart shoes, televisions become smart televisions, watches become smart watches, eyeglasses become smart eyeglasses, light bulbs become light, smart light bulbs, tables become smart tables, chairs become smart chairs, everything becomes smart. And it seems like Albert Einstein would be very proud with our achievements as humanity. But if you look closely on those smart things, you have to acknowledge that some of those smart, smart things are really, really stupid. For example, someone created a smart hairbrush. So now you can brush your hair. Uh, you can get statistics on how good you are when brushing your hair, and tips on how to improve in this highly complex process of brushing your hair. Why would anyone want something? Oh, it's a brilliant ring. You put it on your finger. It doesn't do anything until the moment you die. When you die, you publish on Twitter. Hi. I have no clue why it's This is a smart toilet that will collect information on how much you leave behind. And then you can have this kind of family competition between everyone and see how much people were active and during the family dinner compare notes and, and declare the winner of this week. Uh, and maybe give this person last one so someone else will win next week. This is a smart watch that will uh, um, analyze your stress level, and if you're too stressed, it will scream at you. Being stressed is not good for you, you should relax. This is a smart condom that will collect information on how good you are with um, what you do, and will give you tips on how to improve. So the shoes will tell the door that we are here, and the door will open. The door will tell the coffee machine. He looks like the coffee machine will ask the coffee machine in the office how much coffee did he have today. And if he didn't have a lot of cups of coffee, the coffee machine will make him a cup of coffee. Things stop and things, you know, to make our lives better. But I don't think either of the things will create, as I said, a small change that will have dramatic effect. 
And the small changes that we are moving from a world where everything is always off or off by default to everything is always on or on by default. Let me explain that. Our camera in, the, in our phones, our phone's camera is off by default. It, it will not take pictures unless we tell it otherwise. We have to turn this camera on and then think about it and then it will take pictures. Smart watches like this one or other smart devices, they are always, unless we tell them otherwise, this device will collect information about me all the time, about where I am, what do I do, how much, how many times a day do I eat, do I eat fast or slow, how many times a day do I take a shower or a week, how, how many people do I sleep with, and so on and so forth. So those devices will A, collect information all the time, B, collect new types of information. Up until recently, didn't have digital representation. People didn't know anything about my heart rate. They didn't know anything about how fast I eat. They didn't know those things, but that, now those things have digital representation. So this is a case where the police were able to prove that this guy actually murdered his wife by analyzing her smart watch. This is a case where a company named Strava, they one day decided to publish all the maps of showing where people walk and run and cycle. And, and they wanted to help the world. They said, you know what, let us help you discover new places you can run or new places you can cycle. And they published those maps, but by doing so, and they didn't understand that they actually revealed the secret location of bases, of United States bases in Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, almost no one has smart watches. And if you have a big group of people with smart watches, those are probably people from the United States actually staying in Afghanistan. And you can see the roads that lead to those secret bases. You can see where do people walk and where do people cycle. This is highly sensitive information. When people wore smart watches, they didn't intend those watches to know this type of information. So it's all about sensors. And those sensors will lead intensive privacy mining. This, is, this was point number two. And now we're getting into point number three. And point number three deals with the direct access that people have to our lives. So we are all connected to social networks, Facebook, Google, and Twitter, and LinkedIn, and YouTube, and other types of networks. And what those networks do is that they allow someone to present us with information and see how this information changes the way we behave. Usually the people that will use this ability are people that want to market something. They want to advertise something. So they will show us ads and they will check if, this, if those ads makes us like people or not. But, but, but sometimes malicious actors will use social media to show us information and check what do we do with this information. And the fact that we're getting more and more actually means that more and more third parties will have the ability to, to, to present us information. Let's connect those three points together. Let's say the fact that we're going to have that we have common devices, common company devices, and predictable heuristics. And we will add to that the fact that in years to come we're going to see intensive privacy mining. And we're going to add to that that we are, we are all connected to platforms that allow third parties to show us information. And we get one of the biggest problems that humanity faces right now. One of the most dangerous issues that we have right now which is programmable. The ability to change people's behavior through technology and psychology. And that's, that means several things. Number one, that I don't need a crystal ball or a set of cards to be able to predict what people will do. We can actually develop algorithms that will be able to predict what people can, will do. Giving enough information about people's history we can create solutions that will predict what different people will do in the same scenario. But it's more than that. It's not just predicting what people will do. It's manipulating people's decisions. And, uh, and, and this happens right now. This is a problem 
that we all face in campus right now. And the most important point about that is that if someone manipulated that way and made us choose option A over option B, even though what we wanted to do is choose option B, we cannot tell. People would argue that they wanted to choose option A, and they would explain why they wanted to choose option A, and they would have a very, very clear explanation on why they wanted to choose option A over option B. We have this ability to explain ourselves, even if this explanation is completely wrong. And the thing is that privacy became the most, um, the currency of the internet. It became the most, um, um, the most important business structure of the internet. 2019, still people think that the internet is free, that Facebook is free, that Twitter is free, Google is free, but we know that it's not free. Facebook is a big machine that transforms privacy into profit. You put privacy on one hand, you get profit on the other. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. Facebook is an amazing company. Google is an amazing company. They're doing amazing things to improve humanity. This is what they wanted. People don't want to pay money. And they are willing to, to have companies exploiting the privacy. Even those people who are really angry with Facebook. And they come to me and they tell me, many, you know what? We hate the fact that Facebook is using our data. And I tell them, you know what? A week ago, Facebook actually introduced a new service. This is a complete lie. They didn't introduce a new service. But I'm telling them, a week ago, Facebook introduced a new service, and this service will allow you to use all the Facebook functionality, and they will not use your data. It will only cost you $20 a month. 100% of the time, people prefer uh, pay, uh, pay nothing and, 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 and Having companies using their private data instead of uh, uh, paying $20 a being cut. People are always prefer complaining instead of being cut. We have a choice. This is still on the table. It is not too late. We can go to Google where things cost money. But again and again and again, we decide that we want things to cost privacy. So everybody wants our privacy. Privacy became the most the most important currency of the internet. And it is the goal of the internet. Criminals want our privacy. Um, uh, fraudsters want our privacy. Everybody wants our privacy. Governments, intelligence agencies, entities, companies. So this is an amazing example on how much damage you can do just by putting the wrong type of information in the right place. So this is a tweet. That was published by AP, the Associated Press, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. It was published a few years ago, you can see that on, on 2013. Now, the thing is that this tweet is, is fake. It's not fake. It was really published on AP on Twitter, but it was published by a hacker who hacked this Twitter account and, and published this tweet. And this fake tweet, this, this, this false tweet, actually caused the Dow Jones down for a short period of time, but also caused something like 862 billion damages in 20 minutes. And this is exactly, and when we're talking about third parties using data in order to create damage, this is exactly what happened. This is exactly what happened with the Russian interference in the US election. So the Russians have an agency that hires psychologists uh, and, 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 and other researchers and hackers. And through this agency, they actually initiate uh, campaigns aimed at changing people's behavior. But to me, the most interesting incident related to this talking about was the Cambridge Analytica. And I hope most of you have heard about Cambridge Analytica. Uh, Cambridge Analytica it was a company that was hired by Trump to help him win the election. And the most amazing thing about this company is this is a, a screenshot from their website is that this is what they read. Cambridge Analytica uses data to change audience behavior. 
So this is a company, and what they do is that they collect a lot of private data. They put this data inside a psychological model, and what you get in return is some kind of a manual on how to change people's behavior. But it's not just a general manual on how to change all of the people's behavior. This manual can be targeted for a certain person. So they can tell you for this specific person, this is how you should change his, his mind. This is how you, you should make him pay, uh, donate money for your company. Having the ability to do that is amazing. And this is really, really, really dangerous. Uh, so I'm not sure if you saw that. This is, this is, this is a website. Uh, so sorry, this is a movie that shows Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot is Wonder Woman. If you watch the movie, she is Wonder Woman. She's amazing, amazing, amazing. She's Israeli. Um, so we really love her. And this is a porn video showing her. And this is a real porn video. But the thing is that this is not really her. This is deep fake. Someone took her face and they added her face and her voice to a porn star body. And now it seems like Gal Gadot as a porn star video, even though it is totally free. And the, and the thing is, I'll show you those videos if you haven't watched them already. Big face, the ability to create videos which are totally fake but look real, is another new level of problem when talking about the future of privacy. But this is fake privacy, fake reality. It seems like we are revealing secrets about people, but those videos are totally fake. So what we're going to watch now is a video. I hope it will work well on, on this video conference system. On the left side, um, you can see Bush, which is a totally fake video. On the right side, you see a real person, and the device in front of him takes his face facial movement and maps it into Bush's face. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, what I'm going to do, I want to do with him that. So where do we go from here? Um, where do we go from here? Um, the most important thing is to develop critical thinking. The ability not to accept anything is correct. When we read something on the internet, when we watch a picture, when we watch a movie or whatever, we have to use our instincts to, to try to differentiate whether this is real or fake. If someone is publishing a picture of something, but this picture has no source, no, no data to support it, if this article doesn't show both sides of the argument, if, if, if you read something and you feel that this is this this quote is not real, we have to trust our instincts and be able to to challenge things that we don't think they are real. But more than that, the discussion and the way to solve the problems and bring the secret in the future with regards to the dark future of privacy deals with the ethics of using data. What is, what is okay and what is not okay? What do we think is, 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 is permittable and what do we think shouldn't be permitted? The discussion about data ethics and the use of ethics is a very important discussion and we are as people should have it. The challenges ahead of us are much greater than the ones that we've already seen. We have to be innovative and creative in order to, to challenge the things that are going to happen in the years to come. Trust is something that we can only create together. My question is, how do you develop uh, critical thinking? This is a very important question, how to develop critical thinking. <laughs> so, um, there are, obviously there are amazing books about critical thinking um, that you can, you can read, that I love reading. I read, I think, seven books in the past um, three weeks. Um, um, but there are some, some basic principles that people should be taught uh, in order to be able to recognize things 
which are either big or semi big. And the thing is that we are bombarded with information all the time around us. And many times the people that show us this information has presented. So the way they present this information and the way they present this data is, is, it, is designed in a way that is supposed to make us think a certain thing. And, and, and it, is, it is proof that people instincts with regard to statistics, for example, are usually wrong. So let me let me give you some examples on how we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we see we see uh, people presenting information and how this information is being used to manipulate the way we think. So number one would be things like uh, someone might say uh, wearing seat belts in the car, wearing seat belts in the car increases your chances of dying from cancer. So suddenly there is a noise, I don't know where this noise is coming from, but I will repeat that. Wearing seatbelts in the car increases your chances of dying from cancer. Mathematically speaking, this is true. If you wear a seatbelt in the car, there are less chances you will die from a car accident. So you will leave nowhere, and then there's more chances you will die from cancer. But, but conveying this message in this way, creates the wrong idea about uh, seatbelts. It makes you, it makes you think that, think that, that, that uh, seatbelts are bad, while they're actually uh, um, great. So even though what I said is true, the conclusion that most people have is wrong. Number two, a question um, that I read somewhere. Uh, let's say you have to have an operation, a medical operation. And you have to choose between two hospitals, a big public hospital and a, uh, and a small private hospital. And in order to choose, you're asking each hospital what are the, 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 the success rates in this, in this operation for each hospital. So you ask a big public hospital and they say our success rate is 80%. And you ask the small, public, the small private hospital and they say our success rate is 80% as well. Now you have to choose where do you go. Apparently, most people will choose the small private hospital, while the right answer is choosing the big public hospital. Why? Because in the small hospital, the sample and the, the, the size of the sample is small. So if they, they operate less people. So 80% for the smaller um, for the smaller hospital means less than 80% for the bigger, bigger hospital. It says that if tomorrow they will pay another it's a, a operation, it might really be 68%. But if the big hospital will pay another operation tomorrow, it might choose for 80 to 70%. So there is a high that there's some have noise around them and their microphone is unmuted, but there is a high level, higher level of certainty for the bigger hospital. And there are many Millions of those examples, right? So, going back to your question, how do you develop medical people? I love riddles, asking riddles. I love reading books about that. And what I suggest is learning the basic principles. For example, making sure that books have uh, a valid source. Making sure that if you read an article, um, that, that, that it represents both sides of the equation. It is balanced, making sure that people don't confuse causality with, uh, with um, um, so people usually um, think, so there is a saying, for example, um, that successful people um, make their bed every morning. So what happened is that people stop making their bed and now they expect to be successful. But they confuse the fact that people become successful. And the fact that people make their bread is not the reason that makes people successful. The fact, the fact that people are successful sometimes means that they all also get their bad. So, so but the seventh principle, and I hope this answers your question. How do you see the impact 
uh, on the privacy uh, with regards to the GDPR and the uh, CCPA. So, the, so if I understand the question, the question is, how would those regulations affect people's privacy? That, that was the question? Yeah. Okay, got it. So I think that, the, that those re regulations are a very important step towards the right place. Uh, I think that they are doing great stuff. Uh, one of them is trying to redefine the, 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 the concept, the ownership concept of data. They are telling people that you are the owner of your data and the company should tell you how good they use your data and they should make sure that they will only have the amount of data that they need in order to provide you the services that they promised. And if they have extensive data, they should delete it. And if the data was stolen, they should let you know and so on and so forth. In those senses, this is great. But this is far from being enough. Let me give you just two examples. No, or two issues. Issue number one deals with um, ownership of data. What most people don't understand, and in most cases, the problem is not data, is insights. The problem is your ability to analyze data and get an insight. And this insight is much more sensitive than the data. If I can analyze your data and discover that either you cheat on your wife, or you're your husband, or you're green, or you're sick, or, or you are you, you don't like to work hard, or there's a higher chance of you to die from a heart attack, or one other billion of things. This is a very sensitive thing. Now, now let's talk about the ownership of, of insights. Let's say that your girlfriend talks to her friend on Facebook and she tells her friend that uh, that you cheated on her with another guy and she's about to break up with you. Facebook knows that you are your game, they know that you're about to experience a breakup, and they know that you're not loyal. Who's the owner of this data? If you will come to Facebook and tell them I'm the owner of this data because this is information about me, they will say, what, what are you talking about? We didn't use your information. We used the information that was created by your girlfriend while she was talking to your friend. You cannot take ownership of this data. The question of ownership of on, on, on insight is a very deep and important question. And I feel that we are far from being able to solve it. We will try to solve it, but we will probably not succeed. And we will have to move to it. We will have to shift the way we think about data and privacy. Number two, and I told you there are two issues with the GDPR and uh, the other regulations around the world that deals with privacy. So number one, what uh, was the insight. Number two is the fact that the real problem is not companies like Microsoft and, and, and Intel and, and Apple. Those are not real problems. But there is a problem for those companies, but this is not real. The real problem is that those companies that nobody hears about, um, they are engaged in collecting more and more and more about data. They don't tell you anything about that. You don't know anything about that. Um, they, the regulators don't know about that. And they are using this data in order to do bad things, either to sell intelligence to foreign governments or to use some marketing techniques which are very, very aggressive, or to, to, to get some insights about you and use that in order to make you do things. So to some extent, the GDPR and other regulations solves the easy problem. Big problems is data that was stolen, data that was misused by companies that nobody know about them, uh, data that is not being closed with companies that have it. So, uh, so to conclude, I think the API and other regulations are great. There's a, definitely a step towards the right place, uh, but we are far from solving this problem. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye.